Hello everyone, happy Wednesday, and welcome to another episode of Quandries and Sundries. I hope you are doing well and had a great day. And if you didn't, I hope I can provide some entertainment to spice up your day. So let's just hop right into it and see what's roaming around in my head today. So I came across an article recently that sparked a wave of questions in my mind. And I bet it has come across your mind too from time to time. It's the question, can ro cockroaches really survive an apocalypse? The media we have consumed over the decades has told us time and time again that they are unkillable pests that will outlive us and every other species on the planet as well. Fascinatingly, the article I came across revealed to me that they were actually able to survive the Chicxulubin impact, better known as the meteor that wiped out the dinosaurs. That happened 66 million years ago. It wiped out 70% of all life on the planet and wiped out thousands upon thousands of species from the planet. An event of dark skies, cold temperatures, and massive earthquakes. Well, when they said cockroaches could survive anything, they weren't kidding. They are basically immortal in the way they evolved. Their survival of the impact comes down to three factors. One, diet. Two, reproduction. And three, climate. First, diet. Cockroaches are omnivores, and while that is an uncommon in the animal kingdom, they have an interesting symbiotic relationship or partnership with the various bacteria and microbes in their gut that allows them to break down most substances, even their own fecal matter, just to obtain energy. They're not picky eaters, and that's one of the reasons they survive the impact. Most cockroaches can actually survive without food for up to a month, although they still can't survive without water for more than a week, but that's not much of a problem here. Being that there are more than 4,000 species of cockroach around the globe, a fact that is downright disturbing to know and that I wish I never knew, various species have evolved to eat sparingly, like the Australian wood cockroach that can survive on the cellulose gathered from anything. It doesn't need any nutrients. Cellulose is the most basic of molecules found everywhere in nature. They probably could even survive on its own body cellulose. Now let's talk about reproduction. First off, let's talk about their eggs, because they have a rare type of eggs found only in a few species of invertebrates. They are called otheca. These are like protective cases for the eggs, and it makes them impervious to any sort of damage, microorganism, and weather. It is theorized that cockroaches could have survived the meteor just in their egg casings alone. The case can even survive flooding and drought. Now, while we are on the topic of reproduction, let's talk about that some cockroaches species are born through parthogenesis which basically means fertilization is not necessary. It's a form of asexual reproduction. Basically, all you need is the female, allowing the species to easily repopulate from, from just one female, making them extra annoying. And we have observed cockroaches giving birth to up to 400 children in their lifespan. And their lifespan is about a year. And females have even been observed carrying upwards of 40 otheleca at a time. So you, if you can imagine that, let's say 99% of all cockroaches were killed by the meteor impact. Not that they were. I know they probably weren't. But let's just use this as an example. If you just take that 1%, have them reproduce through parthenogenesis, then within the next few months, that one cockroach can expand the population and actually regrow their full numbers. Even especially since they can survive in Arctic conditions. In lab conditions, we have actually observed cockroaches surviving a hundred negative 188 Fahrenheit or negative 122 Celsius temperatures. The Japanese cockroach will even hibernate in the winter to survive the cold. But if we are talking heat, they can only survive at temperatures of 120 Fahrenheit or 53.3 Celsius, making heat a great way to get rid of them. But please, don't burn down your house in the process. Don't use flamethrowers either. <laughs> now let's talk nukes. We started this with talking about how they would inherit the Earth from us. And the most likely scenario would be through, sadly, nuclear destruction. Well, media tends to exaggerate on this front. 
as they are actually susceptible to radiation, but only in certain conditions. They're only vulnerable when their cells are dividing. And that really only happens when they're in egg form or they're molting. And we have talked about how they can't be harmed by anything in their ortholega or egg casing. Radiation can't even get through it. So we just got to wait for them to molt, which is interesting. And if you want to know something even interesting, when they're not molting, their exposure levels are 15 times higher than humans. That means they can experience 15 times the level of radiation that we do, which is unbelievable to think of. Thankfully, they aren't impervious because if we looked at this objectively, not all, uh, not all cockroaches will be molting at the same time, so we could hit molting ones with a little bit of radiation to take care of them. But as soon as they lay their eggs, we lose our war against them. Not that I advocate the killing or complete elimination of a species, but they do result in at least 60% of all asthma, breathing, and respiratory problems, making them a health issue, especially for low-income households that can't afford treatment and the right terms of extermination. And on that note, let's talk about extermination, because they are tricky bastards. You can spread, they can spread disease and pathogens, so let's break this down into man-made exterminates and natural exterminates. On the man-made front, the first thing I've thought of is to make pesticides. It's what we do to control pests and bugs. But a recent study I read revealed that they break the mold with everything we know about pesticide resistance. Our previous understanding was that it was impossible for more than one resistance to develop. But according to our new understanding, cockroaches can develop resistances to multiple pesticides after being exposed to just one chemical. As we mix and match pesticides to create more effective ones, if we end up using the same chemical for multiple new pesticides, if a cockroach has already gained a resilience on that one chemical, it makes it impossible for cockroaches to be affected by all those pesticides. And think of how fast they reproduce. Evolutionarily, they will become resilient to all of them within a few years. And if we keep making them, let's say it takes a few years to develop a new one, by the time we've developed a bunch of new ones, they'll already be resistant to them. It's really a losing battle. I want to move on to natural means because I am more hopeful that this will work. And they come in the form of parasitic wasps which I mentioned last week in my zombie episode. There are various species of wasps that will lay their eggs in the bodies of different insects, and even cockroaches. And they can even lay them in their othalaka, meaning that nature has found a way to penetrate their impenetrable defense. Scientists are under development of safe mass release and breeding programs of such parasitic wasps to help control or eliminate the population. I think we have all learned something, that these pests are impenetrable creatures that damage our health and are a threat to our survival. I'm all for preserving nature, but I have this view that since they have survived multiple mass extinctions and evolved to outlive every other animal and species on this planet, I actually feel that they have slipped through the cracks in the laws of natural selection and actually need to be dealt with. It's not uncommon for weird or bizarre creatures to come from evolution. But I don't, th I don't think I've read of a case of one surviving natural selection. Well, except for us, we, we've outlived natural selection and we've beat it with science. But I don't think I've ever heard of an animal doing that. Some might call them a fluke, but I think it's just a machine called nature. And who knows if they actually have a part to play or it's just random. Nevertheless, maybe it's our job to take care of them and deal with it. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Well, that is all I got for today. I would really appreciate if whatever platform you're listening to this on, whether YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or whatever audio platform my voice is transmitting to you through, please subscribe or follow me. And I love any feedback, so don't feel shy to tell me what you think and how I can improve your experience here. Thank you so much for listening, and do not forget to share this to anyone in your life who could use a scientific moment in theirs. I hope you'll join me again next time for another episode of Quandaries and Sundries. Stay safe, stay sane, and stay healthy.
This is Van Masterson signing off.